title, Whispers from the Unknown. Author, Paul Chelby. Narrator, Joe Cowan. Chapter 22. After spending hours at the military base, we finally left. We had to recount a false version of events in meticulous detail, repeatedly and to multiple people. This carefully orchestrated massacre had allowed our group, my group, to achieve its goals. We left behind two corpses and one injured person. I didn't even have to learn anything about this staging. De Lespinois's voice resonated within me and had dictated what was necessary. We were in perfect connection. After opening the door, he advanced calmly without saying a word. I don't know. There was a calm and peaceful atmosphere. I believe no one expected this. That lunatic de l'Espinois suddenly grabbed Captain Ferrand and began to strangle him. Sendersay and one of the guards tried to neutralize him, but he showed extraordinary determination and strength. He had become a real beast. I took refuge with the doctor in a corner of the room. Lieutenant Hermé managed to stop him cold by putting the gun to his temple. Fortunately, she had asked one of the soldiers to lend her his weapon. Otherwise, it would have probably been worse. He instantly released the captain. I thought he was dead. Everyone backed away from the madman. I paused and burst into tears. I think if tears had a different taste according to the emotion, these would have been sweet, tears of jubilation, of pleasure. This charade gave me pleasure. I was the father telling unbelievable stories to his little children in the evening. And, and Hermai, poor thing. She didn't see it coming. Maybe she should have moved away. I don't know. He hit her hard. The noise was horrible. Collapsing again, I prepared to make the final push. I was going to sprint and win the stage. I will never forget her face. How horrifying. She was a remarkable woman. She stood tall and found the strength to neutralize him forever. There could have been more deaths, I'm sure. There the line had been crossed. I was on the podium. I repeated this nonsense four or five times. As I went along, I allowed myself some additional juicy details. A true novelist. Whenever questions bothered me, I cried again, and the answers came to me. Thank you, my friend. With Ferrand taken to the hospital, we found ourselves in our vehicle. Our motorcycle escort was back in service. Sendersy was driving. The new Asvut in the passenger seat didn't seem too moved to see the outside world again. I was alone in the back of the vehicle, like a minister. Where are we going now? I asked. Don't you remember, Gabriel? To meet our destiny. We laughed together, like brothers. Upon arriving at the entrance of Asvut's psychiatric center, the two motorcyclists left us. Once they were out of sight, Sendersa turned around, and we left. The atmosphere in the vehicle was incredible. No one said a word. It was as quiet as a desert. Conversation would have been the height of vulgarity. We were together, and that was already the most wonderful conversation. In their company, I discovered another way of being— Without knowing anything about their history and the reasons for our common story, I felt our connections, and they were deep and strong. Especially with De L'Espinois. I felt like I had never been better. Only what we accomplished mattered, and I was a key player in this chess game. We drove for three days without stopping, except to refuel. Many landscapes passed by, many gazes met, the machine was in motion— I remember crossing several borders without any difficulties. Anyway, if there had been complications, simplification measures would have been quickly executed. No one could stop us. It would have been a serious mistake. Closing my eyes from time to time, I heard the rumbling of that volcano within me. I could even imagine it, visualize it. This core of magma, after a long sleep, was awakening. Its ascent was still slow. It was taking shape. 
I felt it close, close to my soul. Its resurrection, its resurgence was vital. I was aware of it. De Lespinois knew that I communed with this force, and he was happy about it, even proud. In the dead of night, after speeding through a village, we took a winding road. Hello, Mom, hello, my dear, I thought to myself. As we navigated a series of turns, we encountered a woman holding her daughter's hand. The end of this journey drew near. This serpentine road would lead us to our destination. The car's headlights, constantly changing direction, created a chaotic procession of bushes, trees, and various vegetation. It felt like we were driving through a forest. People emerged in the beam of light, their appearances becoming more frequent. They knew we were coming. They were waiting for us. I was not a stranger to them. What a feeling of well-being. In the distance, I saw the silhouette of a building. The moonlight gave it a luminous reflection. As we drew closer, the structure appeared to grow, and I could discern its shape more clearly. It had the imperial and warlike appearance of certain cathedrals, but lacked the folly of trying to touch the sky. An immense garden surrounded it, not a single tree or bush adorned this vast expanse. Was it even a garden? This contrasted starkly with the surrounding landscape. A tall gate clearly separated the two worlds. The immense building wanted to keep its secret, or at least, its discretion. We arrived at a closed gate, and no one came to open it. Looking around, I saw no signs of life. Without turning off the engine, Sendersa exited the vehicle and went to the entrance. After a few attempts, he finally opened the two parts of the gate completely. He returned to the vehicle, shifted into first gear, and gently accelerated. Just after crossing this gate, De L'Espinois uttered words in a dialect I still did not understand. Hearing this language delicately spoken was a true delight. At the end of what could have resembled an incantation, the car arrived in front of this, to which De L'Espinois had responded, Palace Gabriel. The enormous Gothic building emitted an impression of universal power. Its architecture was impressive. Many symbols were carved on the walls. Human faces, faces not belonging to our world, representations of beasts, writings. Some geometries must have had a meaning and reasons to be engraved on these walls. Everything was art, but nothing was left to chance. Most of the extremities resembled points directed towards the sky. A door about five meters tall was surrounded on either side by two large sculptures of half-spheres, one with the flat surface above and the other below. Seeing me admire these magnificent stone monuments, Sendersa said, Balance, it reminds us why we are fighting. One day... De L'Espinois interrupted him. It's too early, Kuran. It's useless. Mr. Sendersa's real name was therefore Kuran. What an extraordinary name. My curiosity would have normally led me to hope for the sequel, but I felt it was not opportune, and things would naturally become clearer. I admired again this surreal palace. The architects who built it must have had divine inspiration, I exclaimed in wonder. At this, my two companions smiled. Once the vehicle stopped, I saw in the rearview mirror, in the distance, a group of strangers crossing the gate. They walked calmly in the night and headed towards us. Another group appeared, then another, and another. Dozens of people approached the palace. Others continued to pour in. Now there were hundreds of people who had arrived out of nowhere, and the influx did not stop. We stepped out of the vehicle and looked in their direction. The immense lawn was covered with strangers, each more different than the other. Men and women of all races, elderly people, children, I also saw people in work attire, men in suits, several policemen, workers, and many others. I was astonished to see religious men and women of all denominations walking towards us. Now, more than a thousand people had entered the domain. The crowd that had slowly formed was extremely impressive. Only the sounds of a light breeze shaking the leaves of trees in the distance and the footsteps treading the ground broke this imperial silence. The people who were most advanced suddenly stopped their march a few meters from us, while others crowded behind them. 
No expression showed on their numerous faces. I felt scrutinized. All those eyes fixed on me like guns searching for their target made me suddenly uncomfortable. What did they want from me? What did they want? To admire you. To serve you. To love you. De Lespinois said calmly. He added with the same serenity. We are all here for you, and you alone, Gabriel. The journey has been long. The time of the Bachoha is coming to an end. He raised his arms to the sky, took a deep breath, and uttered words that seemed never to extinguish. Each sound, each syllable resonated like a stifled roar. We were all transported. Others might have called it bewitchment. But this honey shared with each person, with each one of them, with each one of us, was nothing but pure delight. Jean Alexandre's hand gently rested on my shoulder. Gabriel, you are one of them, and you always have been. All these people are your family. What you have experienced up to now doesn't matter anymore. Your true existence will begin here. You are about to be born, or rather, reborn among your own. At the moment, I did not understand the meaning of what he was telling me, but the echo of his words deep within me filled me with enthusiasm. I felt no need to ask questions. I began to read the emotion in him. He continued, I told you that you had a debt to me, do you remember? He knew the answer. I told him what he wanted to hear. Of course, unfortunately, I destroyed your friends. I apologize again. No, no, Gabriel, don't be sorry. The Bachoa demands many sacrifices before entering the sanctuary. But only your friends died. I have absolutely failed. My part of the deal turned out to be a failure. A feeling of shame washed over me. Throughout all this time, I had neglected or perhaps buried these memories out of fear. Jean Alexandre exerted a gentle pressure on my shoulder and said, Think again. You are magnificent. And to think that in this world, some believe that perfection does not exist. They are truly wretched. You were perfect. Furrowing my brows to express my surprise and questioning, he added, Gabriel, you were perfect. But I don't understand. It's normal. The Bachoa, the spirit of revelation, cannot be explained. It is lived, and it leads us to our rebirth. That woman, that nurse you wanted to keep close to you. Carolina? No, the other one. The one who had no choice but to belong to you while you were with her friend. It wasn't a dream then? The Bachoa, Gabriel, the Bachoa. He pronounced it in this unreal and magical way. It seemed to make the entire crowd shiver, remaining still and silent in this semi-darkness. Only the moon seemed to bestow its generous brightness upon us. He changed his tone and spoke more imposingly. That woman, that slut, will die by hanging herself with a rope. The growing darkness will gradually lead her from sadness to utter despair. That was your will, our will, Gabriel. I replied hesitantly. But I owed you. My debt was for three. I killed three of your friends, Jean Alexandre. No, not you. Please don't call me that. He tilted his head to the side. The Bachoa unfolded perfectly. The man whose presence was unbearable to you. That man so disrespectful of your person, Trill. Yes? His days are also numbered. A disease that has already begun its evolution will strike him down. He will die after excruciating suffering. Don't you recognize the place, Gabriel? He gestured with a circular motion of his arm. Suddenly, a vivid image sprang into my mind and interposed itself with the vision of this vast expanse of grass. The magnificent garden of my dreams where I had met Trill and this currently overcrowded place merged into one. As I told you before, Gabriel, your hatred is devastating. Feeling a bit lost, I spoke in an interrogative tone. But I didn't mean to, it was never intentional. But of course, 
it's the very essence of your existence. Did Beethoven consciously want to compose among the greatest masterpieces in the history of music? Was Einstein a fanatic of the apocalyptic vision and the means to achieve it? No, we follow our destiny. Excellence touches those lucky enough to decipher themselves. Your Bachoa guided you through the intricacies of your mind. This place, simultaneously so dark and so welcoming, all these people in front of me, these words and visions, this calmness, all of it plunged me into a strange state of consciousness. I hovered between doubt and conviction, between surprise and deja vu. So many strange things had appeared to me in recent days, so many new emotions, so many changes in my life. Hadn't I wished for all of this with all my heart? What meaning did Gabriel Hesse's life have? Could I still love myself, endure myself any longer? My landmarks, my values, my faith shattered. After exploding, my reconstruction had to take place. I knew it. It was inevitable. The lost sheep would, like the phoenix, rise from its ashes. Lost in my thoughts, a question surfaced. I hear what you're telling me. I see what you're showing me. But wasn't the Bachoa supposed to make me commit three? I struggled to pronounce the word, which was still symbolically abhorrent to me. Three murders, three deaths, take three lives. He emphasized his pronunciation. The Bachoa is coming to an end. It is not finished. We are all here to fulfill this common wish. Gabriel, you are a major element. You are one of the servants of the Source. We are of fundamental importance. We are the construction pillars that have taken centuries of work. But only the Source matters, and it speaks through you, through us. De Lespinois paused and said, Gabriel, I am the messenger, the messenger of our Bachoa. Gabriel, we are one. I am the link between your current consciousness and your true nature, your original being. After these words, a strong emotion reverberated throughout my body. He looked at me and said gently, You are an entity that has nothing to do with the life you have led for the past 28 years. You have slept very deeply all these years. The time of our rebirth has come. The messenger's sacrifice is the ultimate act that completes the Bachua. All this journey, all these fears, doubts, all of it had led us here. My life was nothing more than a vast unknown. Only dreams, instinctive emotions, an inexplicable state reassured me and made me want to continue to go to the end of what had been started. I saw myself at home, unhappy and lost. Ultimately, not even unhappy, just lost. My evolution as a human being slipped away like sand through my fingers. Suicide would probably have been the most dignified way out, but I knew I wouldn't even have been capable of it. I considered myself pitiful, and perhaps I was. Today was the complete opposite, I had become fundamental. Wasn't this resurrection of happiness, of my happiness, the masterful path to a true destiny? I was finally going to live. I was finally going to be. Did I have the choice to accept or refuse what I had always been? Does the wolf question itself before catching the sheep by the throat? Does it regret being a wolf? I contemplated the situation. I observed every person I was given to see. To my right, stood the tall Kuran with his bald head, Jean-Alexandre with Azvut's friendly face, and facing us so disciplined, this multitude of people who were waiting. I looked at the ground for a long moment, thinking about everything and nothing. Then I raised my head and shouted, clenching my fists with all my might, these words from elsewhere. I am Bicabarel, servant of the Source. I will reign wherever I am. My faith and my strength will make our enemies tremble. It is time for me to complete my Bachoa. Everyone began to shout like a pack of warriors preparing to fight. Jean Alexandre said to me in a weary voice, Let's go to the sanctuary to unite. 
I feel myself departing. It is time. His face became smooth again and returned to its initial form after a brief moment. He seemed feverish. An additional step had just been taken. Quran stepped forward and spoke these words in that mysterious language. The difference was that now I understood it. Let us finish Bikabarel's Bachoa. Bring forth the Estred. Bring forth the Estred. These whistling sounds, so gentle, amazed me even more now that I understood their meaning. The atmosphere had completely changed. Everyone showed enthusiasm. Tongues were loosened, bodies moved, and the atmosphere became festive, electric. The human sea was stirring. Following Quran's request, the crowd recited with fervor a sort of incantation. I understood it was an invocation. Witness of the night to each his sorrow, witness of the night for us you are here. Estreds of the source, a servant calls for you. Estreds of the source, a servant hunts his soul. They repeated it over and over again. A slight breeze lifted several insignificant twigs from the ground between the crowd and us. A breath took shape. Other twigs also rose. This movement of air became circular, became more and more animated. The intensity of these appearances became significant enough for me to gradually visualize a wind that became abnormally fast. From then on, I could distinguish four whirlwinds that had formed. The incantatory voices that were being covered wanted to fight, but it was a harmonious struggle. After a moment, the four phenomena must have measured two meters in height for an equally impressive circumference. The crowd suddenly finished their invocation. Silence then reclaimed the space. Remarkably, the whirlwinds made no sound. They froze. It looked like a freeze frame located on these four forms. The sight was incredibly beautiful. The traces of the wind, immobilized in the form of large cylinders, stood before us like genuine statues, four magnificent statues. Jean Alexandre fell to his knees. His breath became rapid and laborious. Not without difficulty, he managed to say, Estrade, I beseech you, take me to the sanctuary. I am ready. I understood that this I also concerned me. This man whom I had felt so alien, this man so external, so different, was neither a nightmare nor a dream. He was simply a part of me, a very real part. Seeing him suffer made me suffer just as much. I had the same feeling as when I saw myself as a child in movies or photos. This is me, and I am this. The immense doors of the palace slowly opened, releasing a multicolored smoke. Beams of light pierced the night, cutting through the darkness like sparkling blades. While this new spectacle unfolded, the Estred revived. They once again became beings of air, beings of wind. The four whirlwinds approached Jean Alexandre, who was still on the ground. I didn't know if he was still conscious. Everyone stepped back as they converged on him, gaining even more intensity. His body rose from the ground, arms and legs dangling. He was lifeless, his eyes closed, and there was no expression on his face, but I knew he was still among us. His body slowly turned in the air. They were taking him inside the palace. Kurani, who had his hands behind his back, signaled me with a glance and positioned himself facing me. Smiling, he extended his hands to me and added, No sorrow, no fear. It's a moment we've all been waiting for. You will return to us as a servant. Come! He then reached out his hand to me. I offered him mine, returned his smile, and we followed the incredible procession. I knew the palace. I had been here before. This was where I had sown pleasure and death. From the outside, its size was that of a great fortress, impressive, but that was nothing compared to the sense of immensity I now felt inside. Columns worthy of those in ancient Roman depictions surrounded the incredible entrance. This room could easily contain everyone present at this ceremony. The spectral vision of Jean Alexandre floating in the air in the distance gave the direction. Quran held my hand and we headed towards another hall. As we crossed, intermittent images came back to my mind. I saw myself penetrating it with all my strength, going to its deepest depths. I had loved that moment. I had loved that place. 
The vibrant colors of the walls, the contrasting representations, stood out against the white, clean, smooth floor like a sheet of ice. There was no light source, no fire, no torch. Everything was light, or rather, everything was luminous. The passage to the sanctuary in the form of an arch could have allowed a giant to access it without stooping. A certain gravity prevailed. The pace was rather slow. As I approached, I could discern this hall more clearly. There was no comparison with what I had seen before. It reminded me of a gigantic stone dome. The rounded ceiling, given its size, gave me a strange sensation, a feeling of importance. Each person must have felt like the core of this room, and that was no coincidence. As I entered deeper, the power of the building revealed itself to each one of us. Upon reaching the center, the body descended from the air to be placed on the ground. The four astrad divided and positioned themselves to form a square. In the middle, the messenger remained agonizing. Kuran quickened the pace and led me about ten meters away. He murmured to me, Here we are. The circumference of the astrad decreased, and a fine curtain of wind formed, connecting them and surrounding the messenger. His voice resonated softly in my mind. The time of our rebirth has come. Let our division cease. The crowd surrounded the spectacle, and Kuran let go of my hand. I felt an irresistible attraction. Becoming both actor and spectator, I lost control of myself. I moved towards my destiny in a state of absolute consciousness. I paused for a moment in front of the undulating. Curtain of wind. The body lying on the ground seemed slightly blurry to me. I crossed this delimited space. Suddenly, what was outside disappeared, and the brightness became intense. The walls of this cube were nothing but a thick fog. I had regained my original appearance, and my mind was filled with incessant flashes. I was once again Bika Barel. A voice of profound gravity echoed, Bika Barel, complete your Bachoa! Holding onto his feet, I let myself fall to my knees, finding myself on top of him. I heard his short breaths, his long blonde hair spread disorderly on the ground, and his extremely pale face smiled at me. His eyes half opened. He looked like an angel. Tears streamed down his cheeks, and he managed to say to me, Despite the present and future pain, these are tears of happiness. He closed his eyes, and my hands surrounded his throat, exerting increasing pressure. Our two bodies sparkled. The more I squeezed, the brighter the brilliance became. Millions of sparkling particles connected our two bodies. I squeezed tighter and tighter with all the rage and fury present in that place. Our two bodies exulted. Our two bodies burned from within. He was fading to return to his place. I was fading to become. To be... I couldn't contain a scream of indescribable power. I was. A magnetic flux ran through my body. My beastly scream became power. The vaporous walls shattered, and the astreds with them. I opened my eyes, surrounded by a legion. I saw them now as they were. Warriors, fighters, each more magnificent than the other. From then on, I knew what they were waiting for. I, Bicabarel, greet you and respect you, my children. My laughter filled the space. I will guide you and give you power by transmitting the essence. The essence. Arms forward, I invoked, I summoned. Source, feed them. Feed me. Make me the conduit. I am your servant. A new blue sphere appeared, but this time its size quickly became gigantic. All my children needed it. In two quick, jerky movements, my arms crossed and uncrossed. The sphere burst into each of us. Ah, here I am back. I will contribute to maintaining the balance. I will take all life wanting to influence the balance. I will damn beings with subversive thoughts. The source will remain in this balance forever, forever, forever. 